If you hopped on a plane thinking you scored a sweet deal for a well-deserved getaway in sunny Cabo, only to wind up in a pocket of air trapped inside your plane on the bottom of the ocean floor instead, what would you do? Ava is the daughter of a prominent politician, thinking she's bound for Mexico to party her troubles away in a five-star resort with her boyfriend Jed and weirdo third wheel Kyle. But little does she know the writers of Snakes on a Plane finally thought of a sequel. Only this time, it's sharks on a plane. Yeah, you heard me right, sharks. And I don't mean the baby shark blasted on a smudgy iPad by a parent who couldn't care less about their crotch goblin kicking the back of your seat all god flight long. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat sharks on a plane in No Way Up. We start out following Brandon, a stone-cold ex-military badass, living that Gen Z dream of living in a van in the outskirts of Los Angeles. Only instead of camping out at Google HQ's parking lot, Silicon Valley style, he's been tasked with guarding Ava while she goes on vacation with her boyfriend Jed and his friend Kyle. Why does she need to be protected? You brought the babysitter? You see, Ava is the daughter of the governor of LA, currently running for re-election, which means wherever she goes, Brandon goes. Judging by Kyle's weird notion of fun, I'd say it's good we have him along for the ride. You, uh, like gonna scope the place out so you could be a terrorist? As the group makes their way past security and to their gate, they cross paths with our second group of protagonists. Little Rosa and her grandparents Hank and Marty, aka Nana. Rosa loses her teddy bear and becomes inconsolable when she realizes it, causing her to bump into and spill coffee all over Ava, who pretty much reacts the way that we'd all want to in a situation but ultimately don't out of fear of being judged for lashing out at a random stranger's child. Ava remembers that everybody's got a role to play when it comes to campaigning, and decides to apologize for her snappy behavior to ensure she gets one more veteran on their side. Along with handing Rosa back her teddy bear, they board the plane and Brandon, against his own better judgment, decides to let Ava sit with Jed and Kyle and coach while he stays up front in first class. Babysitter, it's finally letting you grow up. During the pre-takeoff safety brief, Kyle Kyle can't help but make fun of the flight attendant, Danilo. As he does the safety demonstration, you're gonna really wish you paid attention to this one, Kyle, but that's all right. That realization will definitely set in here in a minute. Why is the plane so empty? It's because it's really old. Once in the air, Kyle still cannot help but poke fun at Ava's perceived nervousness regarding flying, which is a legitimate fear that about one in six people suffer from. He points out that the aluminum tube powered by twin turbo jet engines is in fact an aluminum tube. Generally speaking, anyone who does this to someone they claim is a friend is an ass. Besides, he's clearly taunting the good lord above talking all that and wastes no time announcing it. Don't be scared. Especially not a something that can never happen. Oh sh! He said the thing. Well, there's no going back now. Thank you very much, Jed and Kyle, for screwing up what was supposed to be a five-star vacation. Clearly, you guys haven't seen a single horror movie or watched any Nerd Explains. Scrubs. <laughs> You see what you've done now, Kyle? Your sins have angered baby Jesus, or some kind of like old Norse god. Rosa sees some birds getting ground up by the left engine. Bird strikes on planes are surprisingly common. In fact, about 50 incidents are reported per day, wherein a plane collides with one or more birds. Typically speaking, 97% of the time to be precise. This occurs during takeoff and landing at significantly lower altitudes. 90% of all bird strikes tend to also there Therefore, be below 3,000 feet above ground level. However, bird strikes have been reported at significantly greater altitudes too, with the record being at a whopping 37,000 feet in 1973. It looks, judging by the view out the window, and how high above the clouds they appear to be at this point in the movie, that when this happens, they're already well on their way, or even close to approaching their cruising altitude, which tends to be between 33,000 and 37,000 feet on average for most airliners, which means that this is absolutely something that has happened in real life before. Terrifying, I know. We hit some birds, but all is fine. Yeah, 
What? What do you mean everything is fine? If you know you just hit a flock of birds, you know exactly that you are most likely not okay. Who knows? Maybe they genuinely aren't seeing any signs of engine stress yet, which is surprising considering we get a pretty good shot of a bird getting sucked into the engine, which clearly shows signs of pretty much instant engine damage, which should be alerting the pilots. Don't worry, we're gonna be just fine. After the announcement was made by the captain, I counted another 45 seconds in which we see black smoke trailing the engine, and even a shot clearly showing that it is still running. Somehow, nobody alerts the flight attendants, nor do they notice the flames. When your engine's on fire, every second counts. They should be screaming at the flight attendants as loud as they possibly can that their goddamn left engine has transformed into a freaking fireball. I counted a literal 45 seconds from the moment their engine became a fireball to the flight attendant scrambling to the cockpit. Now, you know what actually surprises me the most about this scene though? Can you guess? The pilots. The freaking pilots aren't doing anything either. In fact, they literally appear to be the last ones to know. What in the actual f If this was real life, not only would the alarms be absolutely deafening in the cockpit. But both pilots would immediately notice the abnormal readings in the left engine, along with the plane's automated fire warning system, and would immediately, likely before anyone even tells them from the cabin, begin the process of extinguishing the fire and shutting off fuel flow and power to the left engine. By the time the engine starts launching shrapnel into the cabin, which, as I mentioned before, is quite a while after the bird strike, and after the engine turned into a fireball, it appears to still be on. Commercial planes are generally designed to stay in the air with just one engine. Sure, there's a noticeable drag on one side of the aircraft, however, these planes are designed in such a way that they can function almost just as well with only one engine. Not to mention, every single airline pilot is certified and rigorously trained in the procedures to follow in these, and many other types of serious emergencies. They also carry an entire book of checklists and procedural walkthroughs in the air with them on each and every flight they carry out. In the real-life scenario, a couple of key actions would take place. The instant the birds hit the engine. 1. Control of the aircraft is immediately handed over to the captain. As in any emergency situation, the most senior pilot assumes control as per SOP. 2. The first officer, or the co-pilot, will immediately grab the book with the checklists and procedural walkthroughs that I mentioned earlier, and look for the procedures for a single engine failure. 3. The first officer would start listing off actions from the checklist, as well as is handling radio communications, informing the air traffic control tower currently tracking them of their emergency. The captain keeps control of the plane and takes the necessary step-by-step -step actions to restore the plane's stability. 4. They would land at the nearest airport. Procedure dictates they would also now receive priority clearance to land at literally any nearby airport, while other flights are placed in a large holding pattern throughout the area. This means that even if they didn't get a warning from their systems, nobody told them about the fire, and and they somehow couldn't detect abnormal readings in engine throttle or RPM readings, which I highly, highly doubt. They still would immediately be reaching for their checklist to cross off each action once they've actually been made aware. This would 100% include the actions I mentioned before, preventing this whole disaster altogether, as they would have immediately contained the fire and cut off fuel and power to that engine. The worst consequences would be some pissed off passengers who will be delayed and likely have to continue continue their journey with alternate transportation from whatever airport's closest to their current flight path instead. Oh my. Well, you can definitely add that to my list of fears. The instant depressurization would likely make things very hard to control for both pilots, assuming the controls didn't immediately lock up due to the damage, which I suspect is more likely to begin with. There are real reported cases of mid-flight depressurizations wherein pilots had been able to maintain some level of control over the plane by manipulating its onboard autopilot systems to guide the plane's path and provide control over the engines instead. In one extreme 
case in 1989, United Airlines Flight 232 was landed after a situation wherein the blades from the engine were launched, very similarly to our situation, into the plane's hull, permanently rendering all flight controls obsolete. They managed to get the plane on the ground by manipulating the throttle controls in such a way that it allowed them to steer the plane and control its altitude. However, in their case, the landing did still cause an enormous fire, killing a ton of people. So these kinds of situations are always difficult to begin with. That is an extreme example though. In our case, only one engine would remain, making this course of action impossible to begin with. Nonetheless, modern planes, unlike the much older DC-10 United Flight 232 was operating that day, usually rely on two separate sets of controls for the autopilot, and the actual manual controls the pilots use in the cockpit to steer the plane. The autopilot may genuinely be another option here, and with the majority of modern airports equipped with the necessary beacons to allow for fully automated landings, realistically, this movie would have ended right here simply by assuming the fictional pilots are actually as competent as real ones typically are, and that they'd either commence a single engine approach procedure shutting the damaged engine down the instant those birds hit, or that they'd use alternate systems to steer the aircraft once the controls got damaged or both. Whatever, let's assume for a moment that this set of perpetually, increasingly stupid actions from the flight crew members to God, I guess, and that this actually did happen, and a crash is now inevitable. <laughs> As a passenger, all you can really do is assume the brace position once the command is given by the flight crew, typically as impact is imminent and highly certain over the intercom. There are a couple different ways to do this, but airlines generally choose what is referred to as the forward-facing seat brace position. This is done by placing your head against or relatively close to the seat in front of you, as this is the surface you're most likely to hit due to the impact. You then place your hands either on your head or the seat in front of you, while pushing your feet firmly down on the floor and balling yourself up to a degree, bracing for impact. You can put a pillow against the seat in front of you and then lean your head into the pillow instead to absorb some of the impact, but realistically, you're still gonna take a pretty hard hit no matter what. Yes, yes, I know there's some tinfoil hat wearing experts out there that'll immediately tell me, but nerd, didn't you know the brace position was designed to make death instant in the event of a crash so victims didn't actually receive a payout. And no, it actually was not. Mythbusters did a cool episode on this where they actually examined the damage caused to the body, particularly critical areas like the spine and head. They even did a crash test with a dummy and concluded that the brace position does reduce the likelihood dramatically of sustaining life-threatening injuries to these critical areas in the event of a crash. This is because this position not only helps keep you more stable and distribute force through your legs and feet equally onto the ground, but also because you're making your body surface area more compact act. And by positioning yourself appropriately, with your head already pressed close to or firmly against the surface it's going to hit no matter what, you won't be slamming into it as fast. And f half of them aren't even bracing at all. Great. Bet you really wished you read that safety card in the seat back pocket in front of you, Kyle. For what it's worth, a landing like that with a full-on engine explosion is incredible incredibly hard to pull off, so I do partially rescind my judgment toward the pilots, in spite of the fact that I do still believe this could have been avoided altogether. Whatever. At least they didn't kill everyone in the crash, just mostly everyone. <laughs> Wow, that is incredibly fast, and yeah, I have a problem with this too. Modern planes are actually designed to stay afloat for quite a while if landed properly. It's obviously never shown properly in this movie, but judging by the fact that the impact on landing wasn't what appears to have killed most of the passengers, I'd argue the landing was probably very well executed. We also see very briefly, right before impact, that the pilots did manage to pull up the nose of the plane right beforehand, a procedure known as flaring commonly done on every single passenger plane to reduce the impact right before touchdown. In a water landing type situation such as this, it's double important, as making sure the tail of the airplane touches the water first 
can, if done correctly, be used to slow the plane down immensely, reducing the impact with which the rest of the plane hits the water, potentially preventing it from breaking apart altogether. There's also the ditch switch, which is a button the pilots can use to prepare the aircraft to automatically configure itself for a water landing by closing a certain valves and openings to slow flooding. We can almost certainly assume this was not pressed, but the flare was done expertly. The movie definitely gives us the impression that this is the case here, with the plane actually remaining in one piece upon landing. So even with the hole that was punched into the side of the plane, I'm not sure if with the angle the plane is resting on the water, that would cause it to take on that much water that it would immediately sink in 30 seconds flat. The famous Hudson River landing performed by Captain Soli looks to be very similar in style here. The Airbus A320 that Soli landed had a hole in its hole as well, as well as a rear passenger door open in air by a crew member or passenger, meaning two additional sources of water flooding into the plane, and everyone still managed to evacuate well, well before the plane sank, reportedly with the cockpit part of the plane still being visible roughly an hour after. This includes the fact that the ditch switch was not engaged in their case as well, as there was simply no time due to how fast the events unfolded. Let's assume the plot gods just needed this to happen for whatever reason, and not dwell on the technicalities too much. Before our protagonists can truly begin to understand the reality of just how they truly are, Brandon comes swimming in with little Rosa and Nana, only she's not breathing. They immediately place her horizontally across several passenger chair armrests and begin CPR. After a tense moment, she regains consciousness. Damn it, now we have to share the already limited oxygen supply in this air pocket death trap with one more set of lungs. Great. You'll see later why there is so many reasons we should have just let her die right here. Okay, okay, I know orphaning little Rosa wouldn't be in good taste and would make this movie incredibly dark. Besides, if we, the survivor, would actually try to pull something like that, the others would all be more likely to leave our asses behind in a later stage. Brandon immediately takes charge of the situation, tells Jed and Cal to stop being little instructs the flight attendant to ensure there's no leakage, and make sure Ava is aware of the most common sign that they're deprived of oxygen. In reality, dizziness isn't the only thing. Symptoms can range from confusion and anxiety to hyperventilation and drastic changes in heart rate. Watch the water level and look out for anyone getting drowsy. Generally, his advice isn't bad though, and we should be immediately aware of it if we're running low on oxygen. In the meantime, getting another source of oxygen while we work to GTFO would be a priority. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why can't they just escape the wreck and swim up? Well, the movie never really specifies how deep that they've sunk, but I would assume this is to be a bad idea, mostly due to the pressure difference. If they surface right there, rapidly and immediately, they'll likely die before rescue arrives due to decompression sickness, or DCS, which effectively causes air bubbles in your body due to the rapid change in pressure in your body. This can absolutely be fatal. Judging by their most likely flight path, they would have crashed somewhere around the Gulf of California, where within about 25 miles of the shoreline, they'd be dealing with a depth of around 50 to 150 feet. If they're near the lower end of that estimate, they could probably surface without any concern about DCS. However, the higher end of that range could already prove fatal so it's not necessarily a slam dunk, especially if they can't verify their current depth. Ascension rates within diving are quite complex, but the concept is basically that you have to very slowly ascend to the surface once you've been down at a certain depth for a certain period of time. For example, if you've been at a depth of 50 feet for less than an hour, you're probably fine. Past an hour, you're gonna need to already take measures to slow your ascent. If you've been at depths greater than 100 feet, you have to take these measures, or you'll be in trouble. 150 feet, you're probably gonna die without immediate attention if you do surface too quickly. Let's assume the worst they're dealing with here is 150 feet, which judging by the scenery around the plane could be about right. They could be talking about an ascent that could take several hours, requiring several stops along the way to rest up before continuing. That's just not happening for them, so staying put is definitely the play here, especially if they can't be sure of their depth. 
The search and rescue operation will almost certainly include the equipment needed to help us decompress safely. If they're past the 25 mile area of the Californian Gulf shoreline, they'd be dealing with depths of 500 to 700 feet, which likely is not the case here anymore, but still relevant for later. Beyond that, a mind blowing 12,000 feet, which is just terrifying to imagine. A never ending descent into the abyss. As the group concludes right after, there will 100% have been radio contact about our emergency, as well as a signal transmission before we went down, meaning we will be rescued if we can last long enough. Because the FAA does not allow passengers with serious medical conditions to carry their own oxygen tanks aboard planes, they are required by law to have spare tanks of their own for exactly such a situation. This means that this isn't only gross negligence and a reason to fire homegirl, even if she hadn't already bit the dust. It's also something that would likely never be the case on a real commercial flight, because these things are regulated so heavily. Not to mention, this would be standard procedure to check aboard literally any commercial flight, and the entire crew would be accountable for any ups if this wasn't done. And I bet you nobody wanted to lose their job over something as dumb as oxygen tanks. Alas, Madison had a single digit IQ and not once in her career anticipated anyone with a medical emergency might ever make it aboard one of her flights. Brandon prepares to go underwater to the front of the plane where Nana claims an elderly passenger had a tank of his own. Again, due to the above, this would literally never be the case as it's against the law and therefore the the tanks right next to them would actually be the only ones accessible to them. Also, as a passenger on board is in need of them, they would never leave the airport without making sure all of those tanks were full. But whatever. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here that's already been beaten into bloody soup. As Brandon is moments away from carrying these scrubs that are putting in zero work, Nana asks her to bring back her husband's hat. He reacts how literally any real non-movie character probably would. Will you bring up my husband's cap if you find it down there? We cut to Brandon exploring the front of the plane, finding the oxygen tank, which shouldn't legally be there, as well as Hank's hat. Ah, <laughs> oh, sh! It's the f scary classical music they typically play before shark attacks. Run, Brandon. Don't you hear the music, bro? <laughs> Great. Now we've got sharks to deal with. As if this situation couldn't get any more messed up. Where's Sam Jackson when you need him? Enough is enough! I have had it with these mother snakes on this mother plane! Brandon makes it back, having earned his own classical theme music for 1v1ing the shark. You're okay, aren't you? Yeah, no, Ava. I'm doing just great. All I really wanted out of life was to live in a trailer at age 60 in the outskirts of LA, being a glorified babysitter that has to carry a bunch of, in this case, literal wastes of oxygen on my back to safety after an incredibly complex emergency while they ask me stupid questions. Brandon chuckles while Ava tries to persuade him to keep on living through the power of friendship. Together, we can do this, right? Before he's finally had enough of this sh and lets the shark take him to Valhalla for some well-deserved retirement instead. I would too. This group is hopeless. And if group projects in high school ever taught me anything, it's that there is zero glory in doing all the work while the rest goofs off and does stupid sh like trying to get cell reception on the ocean floor. Was that a shark? No, you dumb ass. It was Aquaman saving Brandon. <sighs> I almost don't want to help these people survive, but here we go. What the f*** the shark doing on a plane? Hey man, no hate. Sharks got a vacation too every once in a while. Besides, how else are the producers of Snakes on a Plane ever going to get their sequel? The group weighs their options and agrees to sit tight and wait, which is their best option, hands down. Nana tries to tend to Kyle's broken arm, earning her the first strike in Nerd Explains Oxygen Wasting Cup. They shove it back into place, which is something you should never do unless it can't be splinted in any other way. And then apply a splint using sticks and in-flight magazines. <laughs> that looks painful, but that is what you get for being such a smartass. Hopefully, this will teach you a lesson in taunting the old gods. We see a search and rescue crew looking for signs of the wreckage. 
We might not have enough here to last us. I do get the situation is dire, but staying hopeful, if not for positivity's sake, then for the sake of staying calm, therefore conserving oxygen, is an absolute must right now. Nana explains to the group that she was an army medic, and that is how she met her late husband while treating a shrapnel wound. Ironic how life just treated you all to the mother of all shrapnel wounds, crashing your plane in the process and taking Hank out again through shrapnel. The sharks start eating the dead bodies, which is a thing known to happen. Tiger sharks in particular commonly are found to have human remains in their insides. The movie really, really didn't want to splurge on CGI animatronics too much, so we never get a decent shot of the shark. From the few shots we do get, it could definitely be a tiger shark. Although they're supposedly mostly nocturnal, solitary hunters, which does go against what we're seeing here right now. Who knows? Maybe the sharks have just been going through a serious cutting regimen at the gym and finally decided it's bulking season. After all, how often does an all-you-can-eat buffet crash onto your doorstep? The group estimates that they may still have three to four hours worth of oxygen left. There are a lot of factors that could affect this, but given that they're shit out of options, it's not like there's any point dwelling on it. Danilo and Jed get into a small argument regarding the noises they're hearing above, discussing whether the structure can hold. Jed makes claims comparing the structure to a submarine, and concludes that since it's a way thinner material, that as soon as any water leaks in, they're done for. He also suggests his engineering degree makes him one of the best at understanding their current predicament, to which I say, don't bring logic and reality into this movie to begin with, as that sh clearly went out the window along with those passengers about 20,000 feet ago. However, yeah, if water leaks in, their situation is going to get significantly worse fast. But again, planes are designed to not only be airworthy, but also crashworthy. They're designed with these situations in mind, which should lend them some peace of mind. Jesus, it is really not your guys' day. And to think you could be sipping on a tequila sunrise from your sunny resort in Cabo by now had you not flown Spirit Airlines. The plane comes to a halt right before a steep cliff, which just looks like it has thousands of feet of deep sea darkness waiting for them. This is likely the edge of the 150 foot coastal area, meaning there is about to be a three to 500 foot drop off that cliff right there. They rightly conclude that they've gone much deeper than before and start to doubt the sitting and waiting strategy, which makes perfect sense. That means to escape, they must face Jaws. Rosa shares some pro shark knowledge with the group. Sharks don't like bubbles. Sharks tend to get scared of a lot of man-made items. Anything that makes sound in the water or anything that produces bubbles should work. Items that emit signals or electrical impulses are also known to scare away sharks. Provided any of their phones are newer models or waterproof in general, it may even be worth using one of their phones blasting some Metallica on Spotify to see if the sharks might leave in search of calm R&B reef somewhere else instead. Kyle and Jed suddenly remember other passengers that checked in with scuba gear, because of course, we're just that gosh darn lucky. Not to victim blame or anything, but it's been a solid well over 12 minutes since our plane hit the water and Brandon literally gave his own life to bring you one measly f oxygen tank. You could have at least used your one remaining brain cell on remembering critical information like this. At the very least, maximizing Brandon's sacrifice, or saving him outright if the divers had any spearfishing equipment, or even divers' knives with them, instead of scaring your friends. You could have all swam out to safety without concerns of running out of air, likely with some diving equipment that would scare the sharks away, or useful tools that could function as weapons. You could have done so minutes ago, well before the plane fell further, intended to Kyle's god broken arm somewhere else. I legitimately hope the shark kills Kyle first. I knew I didn't like him five minutes into this movie, and now I know exactly why. But the scuba tanks are empty. They have to be, otherwise they wouldn't have been allowed on the aircraft. Right, and for that exact reason, I don't understand why the actual tanks the planes are required to check in for each flight are empty, while a random first class passenger 
did actually have an oxygen tank with them. The search team locates the debris, hoping for any survivors. They send in two divers to explore underwater, who actually almost immediately find the wreckage resting on the cliff. Talk about serious luck right there. Not only could the debris have been carried away by the current, but the plane is so far underwater that it's near impossible to see from the surface, meaning these divers basically stumbled onto it by accident, the first direction they checked. The shark, but it seems their luck ran out quick. The shark creeps up on the diver while the group tries to warn him, like we're in some sort of crappy comedy. He doesn't see anything when he finally turns around and tells them it's A-OK. -okay. No reason to worry. You're all saved. Psych. Jaws immediately crushes their hopes and dreams and makes it clear that one way or another, he is getting his happy meal. I know it's messed up, but <laughs> it's hard not to laugh at this scene. Yeah, I don't think he made it. Valid point, Kyle. Where is the other diver? Unfortunately, if he is still alive, he can't let the chopper know about his predicament, as search and rescue divers are cut off from the surface in these scenarios. If this was a diver making entry from the top of a boat, they could have attached a communications cable to make sure they stayed in contact with the diver. In this case, that's not an option, and divers would instead rely on hand signals for communications. The chopper eventually runs out of fuel and has to RTB. I'm not sure there's ever a real situation where a SAR Hilo would ever leave without part of its rescue team and leave them literally stranded in the open sea. Likely in a scenario such as this, I'd imagine another crew would bolt to their location instead with more fuel and do this properly. Neither is preferable as the actions can't be instant, but I highly doubt leaving the divers would ever even be an option. Bottom line, they need to either last an hour until backup shows up without falling off the cliff or dying due to a lack of oxygen, or they have to head up through the sharks. In either case, they know without a shred of doubt, they can be certain backup is on its way, it's just a matter of time. But as is typical with these kinds of movies, it's always just not enough. Jed and Ava suspect the second diver must be near the front of the plane, and that, therefore, his body should be in the underwater cabin in front of them somewhere. If they can get to it, they can access his gear. I'm not sure what makes them so certain that, just like with diver number one, the second diver didn't just get chewed up before he ever made it inside. Ava checks underwater and sees nothing. Jed loses his balance and falls into the water, trying to make light of the situation when he surfaces. <laughs> <laughs> In stereotypical Jaws fashion, he who talketh sh gets hit. And as such, Jed is immediately treated to 50% off shoes for the rest of his life. Inflation's rough, even for engineers. Jaws is just looking out for his financial well being. Seriously, though, a diver's gear, which, for all you know, isn't even there, just cost this guy his leg. And judging by what they're about to do, Probably his life, too. In an attempt to make me lose even more respect for the characters in this movie, the protagonists decide to improvise a tourniquet from a god airplane seatbelt. Oh, oh he's on the plane. You're gonna be fine. And just like that, strike two for Nana. Keep it up, and we're feeding you to the sharks. It's literally the whole belt tourniquet situation all over again. Fine. In case I really need to do this again. Belts are too wide to provide enough compression to effectively reduce bleeding in a severe trauma wound such as an amputation, and will not do sh An airplane seatbelt arguably has even less support to offer, so this is some serious zero IQ sh I also hope I wasn't the only one watching this movie who immediately thought to themselves, hey, don't airplanes carry medical kits on board, both in front and back sections of the cabins? Don't those probably include tourniquets for this exact reason? And yep, they do. Much like with our oxygen tanks, this is also mandated by international law. Airplanes will carry a wide array of medical items with them for even some of the more severe types of injuries, in case of emergency. Perfectly reasonable. So why the are we entertaining this absolute failure in common sense yet again? I, I can't feel my foot. 
you're fine. Unless you wanted to not bleed out in like a minute, miraculously, and what I'm sure is going to help this bullshit myth spread further, they actually managed to stop the bleeding with these sh improvised tourniquets. Kyle jokes that he at least beat his weight loss target. Jesus Christ, it's just non-stop with this guy. Oh, and the whole time this was going on, Rosa was just standing literally two feet away, getting casually traumatized a bit more for the next 30 odd years by Jed's screams. All the special luggage is kept on the right side. Uh, or the guy whose job it is to actually know this, who currently isn't adding value in any other way since we already have a medical professional with us, who knows where to look for this diving equipment, can actually go down the hatch and do it. He's not exactly built like the mountain. He should be fine. Ava swims through the luggage hold with a lit flare for vision, which is actually a thing that would work, as these flares are designed to work underwater. She gets jump scared by Squidward just as she reaches the bag of diving gear. I literally had to rewind that part four times and played at 0.25 speed to notice what this even was. What is it with this studio and cheaping out on the CGI? After a suspenseful wait, she finally makes it back with the bag. It took her nearly two minutes though. Now, while that is a possible thing for even a semi-experienced diver, an amateur would definitely not be able to do so, and certainly not while swimming, and in this case, getting the oxygen jump scared out of her like I covered in my video about why your heroes will drown. There's masks and wetsuits, just not enough for all of them. Jed's not looking so hot though. Goes to figure, that seatbelt tourniquet wouldn't have done anything, so the blood loss likely did him in. Jed and Ava have a very heartfelt moment where she apologizes to him for dragging him into this shortly before Jed passes away. Ava tries to give him CPR, which, while understandable, isn't gonna help. It's blood loss. Realistically, all you'd be doing is pumping the blood out even faster and more rather than helping him. Without medical attention, Jed's a goner here. <laughs> That would be the sound of the plot gods getting impatient for you to die, Kyle. Maybe you should've just shut the f up like I said, instead of cracking wise literally every single time you open your trap. At this point, you're literally using more oxygen to talk sh than to help the situation. You're lucky I'm not counting strikes, or you would be chum by now. We learn that Kyle's humor is a defense mechanism from some childhood trauma, and oh, it's about getting stuck in the deep end of the pool when he was a kid and almost died. Rosa pulls the Uno reverse and reduces his dramatic sob story to, well, how long did you hold your breath? Reminding him that his only value as a human right now is his lung capacity, and that we don't give two shits about his daddy issues. Just kidding, it's all motivational, and they decide to step up to the challenge and try to make it out of here before they become part of the ship. As the shark's theme music starts playing and the ceiling begins to crack under the pressure of the water, they gather life vests and gear up. Nana claims she was a top swimmer and doesn't need a wetsuit, and they try to distract each other from the terrifying reality that they are currently living in. Danilo and Kyle even come to a head about his earlier comments about the flight attendant's sexuality, but it's a warm moment where he finally isn't a d for once. Kyle panics as they make their way down the aisle, especially once they all see what's waiting for them below. Kyle decides to crack open a cold one one last time as the plane slides down even further. They're at the point of no return here. At this point, any way to exit the plane ASAP is gonna have to be done. Just remember what you planned earlier and how to keep the sharks at bay. They plan to make it to the dead diver's body and use the two regulators between them to draw air as they make their way to the surface by inflating their life vest to propel them upwards. Aside from what we mentioned earlier regarding rapid changes in pressure, what if those regulators are currently inside the sharks with the rest of them? It more than stands to reason that this could be the case. I'm not sure if they have any other choice anymore though. Nana says she'll go last since she'll just slow them all down anyway. I suppose it's good to know someone might be literally willing to throw themselves to the sharks if need be. I know it's f***ed up, but if you're ever in a situation like this, you're gonna wanna save yourself over others. 
ideally in the middle of the pack, so the sharks have to work for you. Besides, everyone who's currently left is a god dead weight, except Danilo, kind of. Rose is a child, and Kyle's worse than a child at this point. If we're gonna carry what's left of this show in honor of Brandon and Jed, at the very least, ditching some of it makes sense. Though, I'd honestly opt to keep Nana and boot Kyle to the bait bench instead, in spite of her previous transgressions. They put on their masks and brave the waters of the aisle as Nana stays behind while she tells Rosa just how proud of them she is. That's fantastic and all, but couldn't we just have her be our front man? and use her as a shield against the sharks. I mean, if any of us have to be taken out by one of these monstrosities, why would it not be the person who's literally accepting their death? You're gonna be gone. It's not like you'll know the difference. Just make yourself useful for Christ's sake and take point. Ava and Rosa go first and start swimming down the aisles, trying to find the diving equipment. Great, it kept Jaws away. Now let's get the out of here. Kyle and Danilo go next, with Nana staying behind and accepting her fate, clutching Hank's hat as the water comes pouring in. Strike three, and she's out. God damn. Nana, if you knew you were just gonna go out this way, you could have at least taken the sharky boy with you and earned that oxygen you spent the last 44 minutes wasting. Congratulations, you were a certified waste of oxygen. Kyle goes back, afraid of the uncertainty of the oxygen ahead, and grabs his last few breaths in what little remains of their air pocket, crying about how he can't do this. Jaws happily accepts his willing sacrifice. For Christ's sake, Kyle, I knew you'd be useless this whole movie. Danilo makes it to Ava and Rosa, who actually found two of the diver's regulators and signals to Ava that Kyle didn't make it. They share some air and strap on the oxygen tanks before continuing. They exit the plane and inflate their life vests. Rosa and Danilo go first, but Ava's pushed back by Jaws. It corners her as her life vest gives up on her. By some miracle, neither this nor nor the other shark seems to take a genuine interest in her, other than ensuring she's basically f***ed without a mask and oxygen. She tries to swim deeper up the plane, just as it falls off the cliff. She manages to get out of the plane with seconds to spare, inflating her life vest and swimming up for dear life, barely dodging the plane's elevator. However, without oxygen, she doesn't last long, before eventually losing consciousness as her lifeless body floats up to the surface. We fade out being led on to think that Ava died, which certainly makes sense, as she would have now been at these ridiculous depths for far too long. In addition to the hundred or so feet she got added to the altimeter for that plunge off the cliff, before she rapidly surfaced. Only she doesn't die. She somehow self-revives like this is some Call of Duty game. And she's totally okay. Sure, yeah. She finds Rose's teddy bear and calls out for what's left of her group. Just as the Sar Helos conveniently roll in for the save. Effortlessly finding her in the pitch black dark and open sea with a searchlight. Except the shark-related deaths, that rescue crew should be playing the lottery with how lucky they are at finding people. On board, Ava's reunited with Danilo and Rosa, who asks if Nana made it. She shakes her head, and they share an embrace, reminiscing about the loved ones they lost due to grossly negligent pilot error. As a symbolic ode to her grandfather, Rosa gives up her teddy bear and throws it into the water. The movie ends, with all three of them dying due to decompression sickness almost instantaneously. And the end of the original eight protagonists, only three made it out alive. Hank was dead on impact, but I do believe Brandon could have survived and purely died for dramatic effect. Jed was a goner once his leg was chewed off due to blood loss, particularly when combined with seat belt tourniquets from our certified waste of oxygen. I'd argue that Kyle and Anna both easily could have made it had they stuck to the plan. Kyle let his demons get the best of him, and in a sense, so did Nana. If she was genuinely such a good swimmer, she should have just let Kyle be shark bait, which he ultimately was anyway, and saved herself so Rosa could have at least had one of her two grandparents in her life. At least then she'd have been worth the effort saving her, since she pretty much dropped the ball on any actual nursing she performed earlier. Of course, had the pilots responded according to protocol here, or had the plane responded according to the laws of physics once it had been landed, pretty much nothing after the crash could have even taken place. In that sense, 
I would argue the movie was beaten. However, in a rare moment of philosophical exploration, I also recognized that once we'd reached the point of no return, the plane was now decidedly going down. The sharks, oxygen situation, etc. I think making it was simply down to dumb luck. There was no real way to beat the situation at hand anymore. So I'll leave it up to you. What do you think? Beaten or unbeaten? Moral of the story, don't fly Vista.